Welcome, everyone. My name is Carolina Kaufman, and we are going to begin. I am the Director of Education and Engagement at the Pentecrest Museums at the University of Iowa. We're coming to you live from the Old Capitol Museum, and we're so excited to bring to you today an amazing program, uh, The Untold Stories of the Suffrage Movement, uh, with four guest panelists with me today. And uh, if you haven't heard already, we do have a companion exhibit to go with this, uh, thanks to the League, uh, the, uh, the League of Women Voters of Johnson County, who helped sponsor the exhibit. Uh, we're excited to share this with you. It will be in the chat. You can explore uh, this exhibit on your own pace, virtually in a 3D experience. And we have one of our speakers today that was co-curator curator of this exhibit. Welcome, and my name again is Carolina Kaufman. I'm assisted by Jillian Schrader. We could not do these programs without the support of our students. I want to thank the Office of the Vice President uh, for their part, for their ongoing support for the Pentecrest Museums, uh, which is very important, especially during the pandemic. Uh, and of course, our partners, uh, the League of Women Voters that have been planning this for a very long time and have been celebrating the commemoration of the 19th Amendment for the last year. This is just one of many programs that we've done and we have one more after this. And now to introduce my panelists, I'm very excited to have and honored to have Sharina Hanari. Uh, she is our staff and does coordinates events here at the museum, but also was the co-curator of the exhibit, Hard One Not Done, A Century Struggle. I also have Alexia Sanchez, who I'm bringing back from uh, another panel we did on the Hard One Not Done exhibit. She's now the executive assistant of Chabelle Solutions and a recent 2020 graduate at the University of Iowa. She just recently worked at the US State Capitol in DC and she's coming to us from there. Welcome, Alexia. I want to introduce to you my friends, Diana Henry, a retired Iowa City School District teacher, uh, a longtime school district teacher and member of the League of Women Voters. We're so glad that Diana could be with us. And finally, uh, not last but not least, Suzanne Wanati Buffalo, uh, my friend, a Meskwaki Nation member. She will be joining us as well from Tama, Iowa. Welcome, Suzanne. The goals of this session are, are, are multifaceted, but one of the things that we are planning to do today is to really look at women's suffrage and the movement with a hard lens, a hard truth, if you will. We're going to decolonize it today with my panel. Uh, we acknowledge that the origins of both our country and the institutions that have uh, served as authorities of information, of history and knowledge and learning and education um, came with it with a white supremacist view. Uh, this is something that we are uh, acknowledging and reckoning with. Um, and that includes, again, those institutions of authorities includes museums, the league itself. Uh, and thus, because of that, we feel that it's relevant to ensure that those stories are told uh, with an equal lens. Um, and so it is very relevant. It is something that still goes on to this day as far as thinking about what it means to decolonize, what it means to unlearn history or relearn history, if you will. I grew, I certainly grew up uh, in a, uh, you know, in a society where I was learning about history in a very uh, sort of, um, uh, just a, a general review of history. It really didn't get in depth, but now we are seeing multiple lenses of this history and we need to acknowledge that. And today, you're not gonna hear the stories of the museum nor the league, you're gonna hear her story. I brought my, my panel, I've chosen my panelists specifically to tell their story on intersectionality, which you, which you will learn about today. And we hope through their stories and their, um, and their lives that you can be inspired. Uh, we are here to celebrate those stories, to celebrate Women's History Month and International Women's Day that just happened two days ago. So we're really excited that this is a very timely topic to discuss. And we're um, glad to uh, be having you today to listen in. At the end, please stick around. You will have many resources that these panelists are going to provide. And now I'm going to turn it over to Sharina Honnery. She is our co-curator of the exhibit and will help frame women's suffrage. Yes, thank you, Carolina. 
Uh, my introduction is twofold. I'm going to be framing how the women's movement really fell short in the ways that it fell short for women of color and then introducing the concept of intersectionality. So this is by no means meant to be a cumulative history of this very complex movement, just to give us some jumping off points for this discussion. I'd first like to begin with the first Seneca Falls Convention of 1848, because this convention has been placed in history as a sort of kicking off point for the women's suffrage movement. However, according to historian and author Lisa Tetralt, who was also uh, one of our keynote speakers when the uh, exhibit first opened at the Old Capitol, Seneca Falls did not become known as the origins of the women's rights movement until the 25th anniversary of the meeting. The purpose was more for crafting an origin story of the movement. So by beginning to tell the history of the suffrage movement here, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton tried to show that the movement had a long and distinguished history, but it also allowed them to leave out suffragists who didn't go to Seneca Falls or who they had fallen out with, because this was a time when there were internal disagreements between the suffragists. Starting the movement here consequentially promoted a predominantly white origin story, leaving out Black women's suffrage efforts and other women of color. In fact, according to excuse me, Seneca Falls was not particularly even important for Black women, nor were the demands made at the convention helpful to them because they were facing both racism and sexism. Black women were not invited to the convention, and the only Black man in attendance was Frederick Douglass. So now, Speaking of internal disagreements between suffragists, initially, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton had championed equality for Black Americans, even signing a petition that pushed the passage of the 13th Amendment. But when the 15th Amendment granted the right to vote for Black men and not to women, this caused a major rift in the movement and it shed light on some of the suffragists' inherent racism. Some white suffragists believed that because they were middle-class, white, and educated, they deserved the right to vote before Black men. Anna Howard Shaw, president of the National Women's Suffrage Association, said, you have put the ballot in the hands of your Black men, thus making them political superiors to white women. Their grievances really highlighted some suffragists' racism and beliefs that they were superior. So now again, the movement is very layered and complex, but for the sake of time, I'm just gonna jump ahead to the 19th Amendment, which is finally passed in 1920. And women have the right to vote, but not all women gained the right to vote at this time. So the 19th Amendment, it prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex, but it did not address other kinds of discrimination that many American women faced, race, ethnicity, immigration status, language, disability. Women were excluded from voting through both legal and illegal voter suppression tactics. Tactics including requiring literacy tests before you can vote, poll taxes, voter ID, and furthermore, intimidation, threats, and acts of violence and murder, such as lynching, were all horrific barriers the Black community had to face long after 1920. It was not until the passage of the Voting Rights Act in 1965, which finally outlawed things like voting tax and literacy tests, lifting some of the, bar the barriers for Black women, but unfortunately in 1965, Black women and the Black community as a whole were still met with violence when they attempted to exercise their right to vote. Native American women too couldn't vote right away in 1920 because they were not considered US citizens yet. They were excluded from voting until the Snyder Act in 1924 was passed, granting them US citizenship. States also, individual states prevented Native Americans from voting using voter su suppression tactics specific to them, such as claims that if you live on a reservation, it means you aren't a resident of the state and therefore cannot vote. First generation Asian American women were excluded from the vote in 1920 because they were not born in the US and so they did not have citizenship. This also includes other immigrant women in general not born in the US and this rule lasted up until 1952 when the Immigration and Nationality Act allowed them US citizenship and therefore the right to vote. And Latinx women contributed to the success of the suffrage movement, especially with efforts to reach Spanish speaking women. Yet again, literacy and language tests remained an effective means of keeping Latinx women from voting. It wasn't until 1975 when an extension of the Voting Rights Act prohibited 
discrimination against the language of minority citizens. It expanded voting access to women who rely heavily on languages other than English. Language discrimination continues to be a voter suppression tactic in many ways today. So now I'd like to move on to intersectionality just to give a good definition as we move into the next part of the panel. Simply put, this is the idea that people experience discrimination differently depending on their overlapping identities. The theory was developed by Professor Kimberly Crenshaw. She is an American lawyer, professor, and leading scholar in critical race theory. Her theory first comes out in 1989. She uses court cases and notices that the courts were either treating Black women as just women or just Black, ignoring the fact that these colliding identities of being both Black and woman produced entirely different challenges that only Black women in America face. She says inter intersectionality was a prism to bring to light the dynamics within discrimination law that were not being appreciated in the courts. So since the terms creation, intersectionality has been completely misused, misinterpreted, and misunderstood, leading some people inaccurately defining it as a radical left conspiracy theory or a plot to turn the hierarchy upside down and put white straight men at the bottom of the totem pole and place the most disenfranchised minority at the top of society. Crenshaw's response to this, no, that's not resolving anything. She's not trying to replicate existing power dynamics just to give people of color power over white people. She wants to get rid of these existing power dynamics altogether to change the very structures of our society in order to level the playing field for all. So that was uh, my intro. I hope <laughs> I covered um, enough and I'd like to move the panel on um, pointing out some unknown truths. For example, the idea that women's rights is not every woman's issue, that inequality for women is not a universal concept for all women. And so with that said, I'd like to pass uh, this on now to Suzanne Buffalo to teach us more what that means, that this is not every woman's issue. Thank you, Sharina. Um, first, I'd like to say it's an honor to be here. Um, we, we are a very old people, the Meskwaki tribe. My tribe is from the northeastern part of um, what's now the United States of America. And we've lived here as a people um, since the mammoths were here. So we are part of ancient America. And I want to start with that because I'd like to make sure that everybody thinks about their own past and what they're connected to. And it doesn't go back to 2000 or 1975 or 1900. We really, all of us are a composite of a number of different influences, some traumatic, um, some amazing changes. And it's important to know that all of that got imprinted on our DNA. And as women, it's very important that we recognize changes that happen, changes that need to happen, the absence of changes. Um, that can impact our unborn children. That can impact their unborn children. So many Native American tribes try to take a longer view of things and we see the United States of America, for example, as being very young. This is a very young country. And I invite people to think of history in human terms as opposed to years or decades or even a century. Think of it, try to, try to look at history in a lifetime of a woman. We all know a grandmother or a great grandmother that's a hundred years old. So when you think of something that happened in 1920, think of it as one grandma ago. And that will make the bearing, the meaning, the impact of that time more, more tangible to who you are today. So when people talk about women's suffrage and women's 
issues. One of the things that comes up a lot is, why are you guys bringing this up again? Can't you move on? Haven't you already accomplished enough? And my feeling on that is whenever someone talks about not knowing about their own history and American history has become part of Meskwaki history. So it is my history too. When I run into people or talk to people who are unaware of the struggles that were then, that tells me they are unaware of the struggles we have now. So I try to take every opportunity I can to talk about history. And as Carolina will attest, I can go for hours. It's, it's just a matter of stopping me. And so I'm going to try to stay focused on this one issue. And as, as, a, as a Native American who is Indigenous to this continent, we did not immigrate here. Like I said, we were here when there were mammoths. And they're gone now, but we're still here. And so that gives you a sense of how, how tied we are to this land. And you'll hear many Native American women, many Native American people talk of great concern for the earth, for the water, um, for the well-being of their children, for the future, what's going to happen to them. So women's issues from a Native American perspective involve um, the availability of clean water and and that's still true today on many reservations there is no clean running water there's no sanitation and when you look at women's issues in africa that's one of the issues the women have that's one of the building blocks they need to have a healthy family um so i think one of the things many native american women one of the benefits they can bring to discussions about women's rights and women's um, abilities to lead is to remind people that this world is really what we have to take care of. And even if you don't have a, a biological child of your own, most Native American communities have a kinship stronger structure that reaches out beyond um, just our nuclear family. And you see that in America where the, the family has been compressed to an unnatural state of just parents and children. Um, we don't think that's what a real family is, a uh, Native American family. And we believe that our mother's sisters are also our mothers. So their children are also our brothers and sisters. Uh, my, my culture my kinship structure, my father's brothers are also my father's. So their children are also my brothers and sisters. And after a, a certain point, you that starts reaching out and eventually everybody is a grandmother or a grandfather to somebody. And in this day and age, um, Americans don't seem to value older women much. And that's really surprising to me because we have so much, and I include myself in that, I'm an older woman um, and I, I'm a grandmother, very proud of that. And I think we've got so much perspective and so many, so many different values and worth in our own native culture. But when we step out of that two miles away off the, off the settlement, we get treated as if we don't have any value in Hollywood or politics. And, so I'm really great to hear we've got Alexis is there in Washington and you you stay there. You you do what you gotta do. Um, so my my point on all this is with many Native American women, um, when the European society, primarily Christian, that came into North America, uh, they had determined that they didn't want to deal with their women and they certainly weren't gonna deal with anybody else's women. So when the treaties were made between the tribe and the governments, the um, decision makers uh, from the American or British side said, we're not gonna deal with any women because if the women showed up with the men, we're here, what are we, what are we gonna talk about? And there was one instance where um, a military leader told the women they could all leave, but the young attractive one at the end could stay and he'd see, he would see her afterwards. 
So that was what how many of the treaty making processes started and many of the Native American tribes, the women were stripped of their roles, not because the men relinquished it, but because the incoming European um, colonizers took it. And it was a difficult, when you think of that, you realize the treaties that were put in place and how many Native Americans rely on their treaties to access to um, fundamental rights like running water and food and education. Um, you see the impact by, by muting, by silencing the women's discussions and what's good for us, what's good for our community. There was a whole aspect that was um, intentionally left out. And I know I'm running short on time here, but I just really wanted to impress that as a woman, whether you're a, a mother, a biological mother or not, as a grandmother in, in a Native American culture, you are prized, you are valued. And many of us, nobody listens to us until we do become grandmothers. <laughs> so it's, I want to impress upon everybody uh, how important this is to Native Americans today still. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. That was incredible to hear. And Suzanne has many, many more um, stories and accounts of the, na of the um, Native American experience, the Meskwaki experience, um, to be more exact, uh, as far as um, the ownership um, and rights to the lands that they currently have um, in Tema. And so we'll, we'll be, maybe hear more of that. Um, we're going to um, invite the panelists to share an untold story and contribute, uh, continue on from Suzanne's um, co contributions on intersectionality um, within their stories. I'd like to invite Alexia Sanchez to share in her untold story. Alexia, it's all you. Hi, everyone. Um, hopefully my audio is Okay, um, Suzanne, thank you so much for um, that speech and sharing your wisdom. And thank you so much everyone for having me today. Um, I actually got goosebumps from just hearing um, all of you speak. So I will actually take my time or my brief time in sharing about Dolores Huerta um, as an untold story or um, not known about narrative that I think is very critical to our history as women, but also history in this country um, and internationally as well. So a quick bio about her, I could go on hours talking about her, but I will keep it short. She's a Latina, she is an organizer at heart um, and is very well known to be a labor activist and leader um, for many years, many generations. Um, her work has been very much dedicated to the many injustices that occurred in the fields of California to um, Asian uh, people, to Latinx people, to Black folks, um, because they were conditions very similar to those of slavery, um, even though she was working in the 60s. Um, the conditions that a lot of these farm workers were experiencing were very similar to past um, experiences in history. So um, in the 60s in California, she joined um, Cesar Chavez, which many of us are familiar with that name, um, in the movement for farm worker protections and rights because they did not have a defense for themselves. They didn't have a voice speaking for them. And so she, she co-founded the National Farm Workers Association, which is now known as the United Farm Workers Organization. And through that, they were able to um, host and plan out a variety of boycotts and rallies. Um, and I think one really important part to note is that she had the philosophy of making these rallies and boycotts nonviolent. She knew that what they were working towards was a family matter. These were parents, these were dads, these were moms um, that were working to provide a living for their families. And unfortunately, even though her philosophy was to maintain them and keep them nonviolent, they were met with violence from officials and from enforcement. Um, but 
I think it's also very critical to know that while Cesar Chavez's name is very much well known for these events that occurred, the movement could not have grown without Dolores Huerta, without her work, without her advocacy, and without her connections. And with all of that, she is actually the person that coined the phrase, si se puede, which in English it translates to it can be done or yes, you can. Um, something also very interesting is that while her main focus was on um, farm workers and labor rights, she also was a pretty great feminist and tried to bring that to her work and to her connections as much as possible. Um, as her momentum grew. Now, when you listen to interviews about her, she wishes she could have done it sooner and realized it sooner. Um, but when she was able to connect the women's rights movement to her work, um, it definitely was a turning point. Today, she continues to work. Um, she supports campaigns all across the US on a variety of social justice movements. Um, I believe she just celebrated her 92, 93, third birthday um, and she's still out there which is incredibly inspiring. Um, I'm 23 and my knees are barely working on me so I give her a lot of pride and a lot of props. Um, and one thing that to bring to the table is that unfortunately her name is not very well known. I did not learn about her until my sophomore year of college. My sophomore year of college whereas for Cesar Chavez, I learned about him way earlier. It was very lightly touched. It was not as uh, much as I would have liked, but at least I knew that name growing up. And so I still continue to feel that frustration that it took so long for me to know about her, let alone know that she's still alive. She's still with us and she's still working. Um, and I think there's a huge disservice to not only our history, like Suzanne says, like we have to know our history to know where we are now and where we're going in the future. Um, and the fact that many folks don't know who she is and haven't gotten to know her through her work now or through her work in the past, there's a mis disservice right now. So I think that whenever I get the chance to talk about her, I will. Yeah. Oh, wow. Alexia, thank you so much. This, and, and you got a chance to meet her, which is, yes. who gets a chance to meet her? Can you, can you tell us in just a few seconds, where were yes. you? And you're right next to her, that's fantastic. <laughs> so this actually, this photo was taken fall of 2019 during the presidential campaigns that were happening in Iowa. I took a trip to Des Moines from Iowa City and I got to meet her not only once, but twice. First at this event, which was a nonprofit that hosted her. And then in the afternoon, the very same day for another political campaign that she was supporting. So, wow, awesome. that's wonderful. Thank you so much, Alexia. Yeah. And now uh, back to Suzanne. Hi, um, thank you very much. I'd like to talk about my grandmother, Jean Adeline. Her maiden name was Morgan, married name is Wanity. And I'd like to start this off by saying, um, I was at my job working at the tribal center about 15 years ago and a young woman who worked there came up to me and said she was so excited, so very excited because a newspaper reporter from Cedar Rapids, I uh, believe it was the Gazette, had called up and was wanting to do a story on Judith um, ben uh, Bender, who is our, who's was on the council, still is actually. And he was wanting to do an article on her because she was the first uh, Meskwaki woman ever to be elected to the tribal council. And I'm looking at this young woman who knows me and knows my family. And I immediately realized I had, I had failed the women in my tribe because here's this young woman and all it took was a phone call from someone who she'd never heard of before, who worked for a newspaper, who told her that he was gonna write an article on the first woman elected to the tribal council. And I felt really bad about that. I'd been busy with family and kids and a grandkid was on the way and you kind of get caught up in life. And, and I told that young woman, I am so sorry. 
I am sorry that I haven't talked to you more about this issue. And I should have, and I've, I promise I will keep talking about women's issues because my grandmother was actually the first woman elected to the tribal council. And that was about 50 or 60 years before that. So that was a real shock to me to find out people in my own tribe, women, young women, younger than me at the time, had, were completely unaware of that. So I vowed to change that. And the reason why my grandmother is uh, the person I like to talk about is because she really is extraordinary um, in that she was the first Meskwaki woman elected to the um, tribal council. And that was one part of why that's remarkable is because as you saw in the beginning, um, Native American women were left out of a lot of the decision-making that the governments didn't deal with men. They, I mean, with women, they only deal with men. And I'd like to start a little bit earlier and say that she was born 30 years after Native Americans were considered human beings. I know that sounds weird, but 1879, Standing Bear, a Ponca leader, ex argued in U.S. District Court that Native Americans are persons within the meaning of the law. Even the Pope was asked to weigh in. And um, finally, it was determined that maybe, maybe they are. So to err on the side of caution, yes, they were human beings. So she, my grandmother was born 30 years after that. Uh, she was born in 1910. Um, she was nine years old when the 19th Amendment was certified. She was 13 years old when she became a United States citizen. So the irony of that is here, we've been here for tens of thousands of years. And then finally, when she's 13 years old, she's recognized as a US citizen. Uh, she worked as a medical technician at the sanitarium. She went to Haskell Institute, which is an Indian college, graduated from there with a degree in home economics. My grandmother at her young age was very interested in things that are still relevant today. Sanitation, clean water, healthy babies, nutrition, and she did work with um, a local doctor who only came out to the settlement once a month to see, take patients. So she would go and check in on them in the meanwhile. How are they doing? How are those babies doing? Taking temperatures. Um, she really was a person completely committed to women's issues and issues of the family. She might not have seemed like the type of person. She was very nice very open-minded, very gentle. And to some people, nice means submissive. And that is not the case with my grandmother. Yes, she is a very nice person. Was she submissive? No, she wasn't. And I think as Native American women, we often get put in that stereotype of being quiet and being meek and, and kind of a follower. And I can tell you that's not true. Um, after she graduated from Haskell, she did marry my grandfather and Frank Wanity Sr. They had nine children. Um, let's see, when she was 46 years old, I'm 58, something like that. When she was 46 years old, um, she was elected to the tribal council. So I always have to think where I'm at in my time frame compared to what she was doing. And she's just remarkable in that sense. She had, at the time she was elected, she still had children seven, eight, and 11 living at home. She had older children that had left the home. And when I think of how busy you can be with kids that are seven, eight, and 11, I'm even more amazed at what she got done. Um, in that same time period, uh, she was reelected twice to the tribal council, um, took Bureau of Indian Affairs to court and won um, regarding keeping the school tribally here in the settlement instead of shipping them off somewhere else. Uh, she was the founding member of the North American Indian Women's Council, and that was 1970. She was 59 years old. She served in the position of the Director of Indian Culture. So in 1970, she was also a part of the Executive Board of the Iowa Human Rights. Uh, she, in the meanwhile, in her off time, she also taught Meskwaki language and um, traditional crafts and created an elementary school text in the Meskwaki language. She was part of the Meskwaki school board. 
Um, I'm wow. running she's, over all this. She's accomplished so much. In 1975, oh when she was 64 years old, she attended the Iowa State Fair to participate in the International Women's Year Day activities. Um, in 1976, she was National Indian Council on Aging. In 1977, she was 66 years old, attended the International Women's Conference in Houston, Texas. She was um, a delegate from Iowa and attended the American Indian Caucus. She was so excited because she saw Bella Abzug and she wanted to reach out and hug her, but the security guards wouldn't let her. Uh, there's a whole article about when she went to Houston and you hear the stories about they were told that they didn't have rooms and that was true. And she was there and didn't have rooms and uh, she was there with her daughter, my aunt Marion. And um, she's part of the Older Iowans Legislature in 1977. In 1978, half of the homes in the Meskwaki settlement did not have running water or indoor plumbing. Not, that's not 1878, that's 1978. So we're talking about a woman who was, who was having discussions about women's rights with some people who could never, who could never identify with what her daily life was. I remember when I was young and we lived with her and then we also lived next door. We didn't have indoor plumbing, we had an outhouse. <laughs> and people wow. who were in the depression, many people my age in the, in the community can really relate to that because we we're living under the same conditions. So she was very active. Um, her husband passed away, my grandfather, when she was 74. She is a language specialist resource for the Smithsonian Institution. Um, she was um, put into the Iowa Women's Hall of Fame when she was 82 years old, along with Mamie Eisenhower, uh, who was wow. in posthumously, and she died when she was 85. Mm. I'd just like to say that she represented her people throughout her life through her work as an elected member of the Tribal Council, as a linguist working to preserve the Meskwaki language, as a prolific artist creating and elevating the art of applique sewing, finger weaving and being an advocate for women and children everywhere. She leaves a legacy of kindness, inclusion, courage, strength, persistence, and hope to all people. And she does, whenever she would speak, she would speak through the lens of her culture really quickly. That first uh, quote about her, men have visions, women have children. Some people, some young women that strikes as uh, maybe not a positive sex a statement, but when I asked her about it when she was older, she explained to me this way. Men can only have visions. Women are the one who have the children. Women are the ones who makes the world. Right. So I think when we think of things that are said from a different time or a different culture, we need to really kind of make sure we're understanding where they're coming from. Right. And her value yeah. for women was the family and the home and she was an equal partner with her husband and i can i can tell you that for <laughs> a fact there was no dominant person in that in that household mm -hmm. and she raised all of her children her daughters and her sons um to understand that was the expectation that they thank, be equal partners thank you suzanne i hate to say this but we have to move on to give the other panelists some time but this was incredible to hear thank you I'm going to turn over to Sharina to share her story. Yes, and thank you, Suzanne. I love that and how visions, but women are the ones who create the world. So, um, but this, my my person, I'm going to introduce my aunt. Uh, we call in Farsi, Emma means aunt. So my Emma Taher. Um, so my dad arrived in uh, the U.S. in 1977 and just before 1979 hostage crisis with Iran and the U.S. And he became a citizen in 1994 and immediately applied for his sister's um, green card. Well, it took 20 years for us to even get a response. And this is because there are these complications between Iran and the U.S., that placed major barriers. She finally got her green card, but you know, at this point she's in her fifties, she'd been waiting so long. And she, my dad said, now is the time, come on, you have to 
you have to live with us for three years because she had to establish residency, but she didn't want to leave her grandchildren. So it was really difficult for her. And also she had to learn English to pass the, the immigration test. So it was a really difficult time for her, but I just, I have so much um, respect for her for, for and, and, and it just, her story teaches a lot that it's not an easy road to get citizenship for a lot of immigrants. Um, it's not, especially when for, for Iranian uh, immigrants due to the tensions with the, the political tensions between the US. Um, but she finally did get her, her citizenship and in her interview when they asked her why, they always asked, why do you wanna become a US citizen? And she said simply, because I want to vote. And I thought that was a really powerful thing, very strong reminder. You know, these women have, our, our, our elders have gone through so much and we, they still are and we still are. So I'm happy to continue to speak for my, my aunt and anyone of my family members that have come here. Um, and I just want, also wanted to kind of bounce off um, uh, Alexia when she said, yeah, I, I also didn't learn about these uh, concepts until college. I wasn't, I didn't learn about the concept of othering or Edward Said's Orientalism until college, but I, I do want to give Diane, Diana a chance to speak. So I'm going to pass the mic. Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you, Sharina. And um, Sharina is offered to um, uh, provide her email to anybody if you have follow-up questions, especially on the stories of immigration uh, as far as uh, Iranian women are concerned and Middle Eastern studies. Hi, Diana, welcome. Yes, thank you. I am so uh, pleased to share some information about three women I admire. Though born either during the Civil War or just a few years after the war, their achievements were extraordinary. Each worked in tandem for suffrage and civil rights. And so you see the picture here of Mary Church Terrell. So I wanna start with her first. She was born in 1863 in Memphis, Texas. She was a daughter of former slave, but she graduated from Oberlin College in Ohio with a BS degree in 1884 and a master's degree in 1888. She taught in Washington, DC at the first African-American public high school in the nation. She married Heberton Terrell in 1891. Her activism was sparked in 1892 when a friend was lynched in Memphis because his business competed with whites. She, along with journalist Ida B. Wells, organized anti-lynching campaigns to mobilize advocates and generate awareness. She co-founded the National Association of Colored Women in 1896 and was its president until 1901. She believed that as one succeeds, the whole race will be elevated. Her words, lifting as we climb, became the motto of the organization. She spent her life fighting for universal suffrage, freedom, and equality for men and women of all colors. The second person that I want to talk about is Helen Downey. And Helen Downey is this person who is seated, that you see seated here with her hair put up. Helen was born in 1874 in Ottumwa. Her husband was Russia Downey. In 1902, she founded the Iowa Federation of Colored Women's Clubs. And as an aside, in 1910, the Iowa Federation of Colored Women Clubs united with the National Association of Colored Women, which Mary Church Terrell had founded. 
in 1903, Downey, under Downey's leadership, eight clubs were established here, right here in Iowa. And there were more than a hundred members. The association had an active suffrage committee. In 1919, Downey spearheaded a project to secure housing for African-American female students who could not live on the University of Iowa campus dormitories. With her initiative, the Iowa Federation of Women of Color, they purchased a house at 942 Iowa Avenue, right here in Iowa City for black female students. It was known as the Federation House. The last person I wanna talk about is Sue Wilson Brown. And she's the woman that you see with the uh, necklace, the pearl looking ne necklace. Now she was born in 1877 in Virginia, but her parents came to Iowa and she was real in Oskaluska, Iowa. And her husband was lawyer Joe Brown. She founded the journal titled The Iowa Colored Women, which was the literary arm of the Iowa Federation of Colored Women's Clubs in 1907. And she served as the editor until 1909. She was the president of the Federation from 1915 to 1917. She worked with Helen Downey to acquire the Federation House for those African-American female students to live in that place in Iowa City. And coincidentally, she founded the League of Colored Women Voters, August 1919, in advance, in advance, of the Iowa League of Women Voters formation on October the 2nd, 1919. Finally, you can see that all these women were connected with the National Association of Colored Women. But what might you ask do their experience mean to me? Well, they realized that even within a Jim Crow environment, they could still organize and strategize as a group to bring about educational, economic, and civil rights changes in the African-American lives. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diana. I, I I hear lots of applause <laughs> out in out in the web there and uh, and here on the Capitol steps. Thank you very very much. Very powerful to hear. We did not grow up with this, unfortunately, but this is not where it ends. We have the opportunity to learn more. All of the programs that we do, at least the ones I'd like to do, um, and in collaboration with the league, is a stepping stone. This is meant for you to take from here and learn more. Um, and so I'm going to provide very briefly just a summary of the many, many different resources that all of our panelists have provided. Um, my assistant is going to put in the chat a Google slide that is available to everybody of, with all these resources. So I am not going to go for, through each resource. You will have the chance to explore the resources that you want. They include, from Diana Henry, many, many books, including books for children which are wonderful to have, um, please look at that. Um, and then also um, uh, from Sharina, uh, many different websites, links, and of course, uh, one book, Persepolis, which has a movie, I recommend it highly. If you have teenagers at home, this is a really good one too. Um, and of course, from Suzanne Wanati, the Meskwaki Nation has a wonderful pamphlet. If you want this pamphlet, she can send it to you directly and we can share her email. And of course, a few books and links. And uh, also Sharina provided some additional information about intersectionality. And then my own little contributions, including 
this amazing book called Mass Mothers of Massive Resistance. The reason why I chose this book is because it's about white women at the time of both Jim Crow and on through the 60s and the politics of white supremacy. Uh, and it's very, very fascinating. This woman did an incredible amount of research. I highly recommend it, among other teaching resources that I highly recommend to learn about the women of color during these times. And now I wanna open it up for conversation from the audience. I'm gonna stop sharing here. You are allowed to put a question in the panel. Uh, I have my assistant monitoring that and you can also contribute a question in the, uh, um, both the chat or the Q&A. Uh, do we have any questions? Let's see. Jillian, would you like to highlight any questions that we might have? So we've gotten one question from Kay Meyer. She said that she learned about Dolores Huerta from documentaries on PBS, but it seems that only people who look at those certain resources get that education. So how can documentaries and others um, really important sources get wider viewership? If any of you guys have ideas about that. Um, so I can share really quick. Um, I know which documentary you're talking about and unfortunately it's pretty um, exclusive for PBS. Um, but I will say that YouTube is one of my favorite resources. She is incredible in the fact that she does a lot of interviews um, of her time before when she was younger, um, but also now and what she's doing today. And um, I appreciate that YouTube is free and you can go into a black hole of information. And I actually am pretty uh, frequent at those. But what I find is that that often leads me to other names and other women in history. And I just continue my learning from there as well. Um, so that would be my one suggestion. Thank you. Do we have other questions coming in? Um, we have one question and comment about Sharina's aunt. She says the story about Sharina's aunt was beautiful. I wonder, are Iranian women not able to vote in Iran? That's a good question. Um, I believe Iranian women are uh, allowed to vote. I should know this. Um, but they, they are allowed to vote in Iran at this time. The, the regime is just incredibly oppressive for uh, all, all people there at, at this time. And my dad's main um, aim to, to secure her citizenship here is truly this fear that if the US goes to war with Iran, we have to get my family to safety. So, um, but at this time, Iranian women, they do, ex they do ex experience a lot more freedoms than uh, you'll see them they're supposed to cover their hair, but the women, my cousins included, wear it very loosely. And it, they have their own forms of just kind of sticking it to the, the man or the regime. <laughs> um, they are, they're actually incredibly progressive women in, in Iran, and they're very proud of that, so. Thank you for that. And Karen Cubby is wondering, what are a few things that women can do to broaden our voices and local and state issues? I would say uh, join the league. A great and simple answer. Thank you, Diana. <laughs> and in our, re by the way, in our resources, we have provided the links to the league and other organizations like it to join. So thank you, Diana. Um, and then we have another question for Suzanne and maybe any of the other um, panelists. They ask, when we as a nation celebrate anniversaries of suffrage in America, is it offensive to you, Suzanne? How do you wish people could talk about these anniversaries with more inclusivity or honesty? And a similar question to any other panelists who would like to answer. Well, I think um, I think it's important 
to recognize history. And I think we need to be careful that we don't filter the history we don't like out. Um, we think all of, all of the events that happened build towards something better. And I, I think opening up things like this, opening up the dialogue and thank you, Carolina, for thinking of what the experiences were for other uh, groups of women in the past, but also that brings it present. And I think that the more as women, we insist on having um, access to discussions and programs like this, um, the more we can build on um, the future and how we celebrate things then. Thank you. And unless other panelists have anything to contribute, contribute to that aspect, feel free. Um, I would just say, yes. uh, Carolina, you suggested to me just as I was preparing myself for this panel, because even sometimes, you know, I get so hyper focused on my my expertise being these narratives of Iranian women who immigrated into America. Like that's very specific. So. Uh, Googling decolonizing the suffrage movement led me to a lot of incredible resources. And um, that was just really good advice. I would also say if, as Diana suggested, join the league or volunteer. If you can talk to an elementary school about your story, just see if you can talk to teachers. They, they want people like us all the time to give our story because that is how we break these, um, these uh, you know, barriers to, to education and, and, and highlight our history where, and, you know, and move it away from the, the dominant, the predominant history. We're trying to change the story to shed light on these important stories. The other thing I would add is that people start visiting various, uh, ethnic museums. You got uh, Native American museums, you got uh, Latino no, no museums, you got African American museums, you got Asian museums. Visit these museums. They're out there. Uh, They're welcoming. They got all kinds of activities for adults and children. Visit museums. That's so wonderful to hear, <laughs> especially when museums have a history of not making people feel welcome. And uh, I can attest to that, but we want to change that. And we are changing it. Uh, this is, it's not just the pandemic that's brought out issues of equity in places like museums or education. It's been happening. We're building, we're lifting as we climb. Right. Yeah, as we're really changing and uh, there are a lot of online uh, because of the pandemic, they're doing a lot of online activities, a lot of offerings online. So, you know, go online, find these museums, see what they're doing. Well, and I, I think that's really important. Um, sometimes museums and other educational institutions need to be prodded, show up, write a letter, send an email, go to meetings. Um, uh, I have touch base with many museum um, interpretive staff walking in, they walk up many times they're volunteers. But if you put this request for information um, to the staff, they're gonna need to respond to it at a certain saturation point. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> we have time for probably one more question. Jillian, is there another question in the queue that we can address? Yes, we have one more question that asks, what are each of your groups fighting for most today? Do you share what is needed most or is it different from each other? I can share really quick. Um, I don't know if it necessarily um, touches on your question, but I think one really big thing that I take into consideration with 
the women's movement and the different identities and how they intersect is that there very much is a need for unity and for harmony. Um, my struggles can be very similar to another woman with different identities and they can also be very different as well. Um, and making sure that we are harmonizing that power and that spotlight and that um, attention when needed. I think is very critical if we're all going to move forward in the future we have to recognize when it's time for us to step up but also when it's time to elevate another voice and elevate their struggles and their needs as well so i think this past year in 2020 showed that there there is a demand and a need to showcase different voices when they are being oppressed or when they do need that voice and if I have a platform and if I have a voice to elevate that, then I should. Well, I will concur what you said and what all the panelists have, have said. Um, we need to, um, if women need to make, make sure that they stop worrying it so much about the, the, what's happening on their, how they look outwardly and focus on what's in their hearts and in their minds and, 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 and make men understand that there, there is more worth to women other than just how they look physically. They have so much more to offer uh, to uh, the community, the nation. Thank you. I, I want the other panelists to answer this question, but I want to be mindful it is one o'clock and I do want to share momentarily between answers. Thank you so much, Diana. Um, just real quickly that um, if you are enjoying this so far and we hope you have, um, we want to again thank our sponsors and supporters and partners, the League of Women Voters, the University of Iowa Center for Public Policy, the Gazette, the Iowa City Press Center Citizen, and of course, City Channel 4, who streamed this live. We have an upcoming session, which we will send out to all registrants uh, so that you can sign up for next month. It's called Salute to Iowa Women Politicians, so please come back for that. Um, I'm, I'm going to allow the panelists, if they are willing, to stay for a couple minutes to continue answering their questions and, um, and, uh, and invite anybody um, to stick around if they'd like. But if you have to go, we understand. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing this and again, um, allow people to continue answering the question. I just wanted to say I, I definitely agree. Uh, Alexia and Diana said that very well. I don't have a whole lot to add. Um, one thing that really struck me after the after George Floyd's murder, um, Hassan Minaj is a uh, comedian. Um, he is, I believe, Indian and Muslim American, uh, and so you know his his identity intersectionality like. I can relate from the Muslim community side, immigrant side, but um, but he also is very different from me. And th these things are important to remember that th these experiences, they do matter that they're different, but he called out, he said, all of you guys, I'm calling out to the immigrant community. When George Floyd was being killed, it was in front of storefronts owned by immigrant um, Americans and they did nothing. So he, he used that platform. And I think that's where, you know, that's what the, what intersectionality is kind of about. Sometimes it's very specific, but other times you can use your platform to talk uh, to your community and call them, especially when your black neighbors are in need of help. That's when you corral your community and say, we need to do something about this. Great, thank you. Um, again, thank you for coming to the Untold Stories of the Women's Suffrage. I wanna thank all my panelists and our partners. It was wonderful. This was a, a truly truth-giving session uh, to decolonize and we will continue to do so. Thank you, my friends. Mm -hmm.